Right. Okay. All right, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the 26th annual UWSP Teaching Conference. So excited to see many of you here face-to-face, uh, -face, masked. You still all look very beautiful. Um, those of you who are attending virtually, um, both now and will be attending virtually, virtually this afternoon, thank you also for being here. Uh, my name is Lindsay Bernhagen. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. I'm the director of the Center for Inclusive Teaching and Learning. And before we kick off, I just want to give an extra shout out to Sarah Olson, who hates the spotlight, but is behind all the logistics here. She'll stay hiding in the corner like she likes to. We, we respect that desire. Good morning. Uh, and I'm going to hand it over to our interactive theater troupe led by a Siddle faculty fellow for this year, Lisa Sanderson. So that's what I, it's all them now. Had to turn it down. We were playing jazz music earlier. <laughs> oh, true. We had the smooth jazz. I forgot about that. Do you have your green card? You're pretty for a black girl. You're an Oreo. What are you mixed with? You speak English really well. Where are you from? So, who's the man in the relationship? You sound white. Can I touch your hair? You should smile more. All black people have straight teeth. I wish my hair was like yours. Is that real hair or horse hair? Do you speak African? Do you have your green card? You're pretty for a black girl. You're an Oreo. What are you mixed with? You speak English really well. Where are you from? How long have you been in the US? So who's the man in the relationship? You sound white. Can I touch your hair? You should smile more. All black people have I wish my teeth. hair was like yours. Do you speak African? Is that real hair or horse hair? Do you have your green card? You're pretty for a black girl. You're, You're an Oreo. What are you mixed with? You speak English really well. Where are you from? How long have you been in the US? So who's the man in the relationship? You sound white. Can I touch your hair? You should smile more. All black people have straight teeth. I wish teeth. my hair was like yours. I wish my hair was Is that real hair or horse hair? You speak black You're pretty for a black girl. You, you, you speak English really, really well. well. Do you, you have African? your green card? You speak English really well. well. You're I wish my hair was like yours. You should smile more. So who's the man in the relationship? You should smile more. You should smile more.
Thank you, everyone. Our presentation is entitled, You Should Smile More, a theater-based exploration of microaggressions and macro hurts. So uh, before we begin, we would like to do a land acknowledgement. Uh, we are sharing this time with you on the ancestral lands of the Ho-Chunk and Menominee peoples. Uh, if you'd like to, you can go to that link, uh, that first link there to see a map of all tribal lands here in the state of Wisconsin. Uh, to learn more about land grab universities, universities that are built on lands taken from indigenous peoples, starting in 1862, which the University of Wisconsin-Madison is one of them, uh, you can go to that second link there to learn more about that. Um, we're just going to go around and introduce ourselves really quick and give our pronouns and what we do here at UWSP. So. My name is Samuel Coons. I'm a, I go by he, him, his, and I'm a fourth year acting major. My name is Ryan Niedenthal. Uh, I'm a sophomore musical theater major here, and my pronouns are he, him, his. Hello, everybody. My name is Vanessa Guillen. I am a sophomore drama and chemistry double major, and yeah. <laughs> yep, and hi, I'm Lisa Sanderson. I'm a faculty fellow for the Center for Inclusive Teaching and Learning. I also teach in the Department of Theater and Dance, and I'm a positive youth development educator working with the Hmong and Latinx communities for UW Medicine in Sheboygan. And my pronouns are she, her, hers. So I wanna share that all the statements in the first scene were spoken at University of Wisconsin Stevens Point or UW Madison by students to other students. And as we had credited, um, the photos were taken with Dr. by Dr. Lindsay Bernhagen. So that, uh, what she was doing was modeled after a campaign called i to m Harvard. And we're gonna see more about that later in the presentation. So this whole presentation is supported by the Center for Inclusive Teaching and Learning Faculty Fellowship in Diversity and Inclusion. Uh, participating actors are volunteer artist, activist, and a Pathways intern, all part of the Department of Theater and Dance, as well as other programs and curriculums here at UWSP. This presentation is the result of a student-led collaboration and individual anti-racist slash cultural, cultural competency work. And did we all want to share what other uh, department affiliations we have? Sure. Uh, I'm also a double major political science major. And like I mentioned earlier, I am a drama and chemistry double major, as well as a part of a uh, sorority here on campus. All right, so our overview for today, we're going to explore microaggressions in academic, theatrical, poetic, and interactive ways. First, we'll establish a community agreement and we'll address any access needs. Ryan is going to share a working definition of microaggression for clarity and just for a shared place to start our conversation. We're incorporating some videos that Vanessa found to bring additional voices and live perspectives into the room. Sam is going to share a Kahoot. How many of y'all are familiar with Kahoot's classroom tool? All right, <laughs> I had never seen this. And that's uh, gonna be facilitate discussion around microaggressions. Vanessa will give a spoken word performance called Deserving. Then we'll take a five minute bio break. And then in the second uh, kind of portion of our presentation, we're gonna present some interactive reenactments of microaggressions at least two that were that have been seen at Stevens Point. And you all will have the opportunity to either direct us in those to fix them and make them less harmful, or to participate yourself and take the place of a teacher or a student and fix it. All right. So that's what we're doing today. So if you're on the webinar, please put a comment in the chat if you need tech support throughout this presentation. Can anyone not hear us right now? Raise your hand if you need us to talk louder. Or... Nope, it's not really that big of a room. This session is being recorded, FYI, and a Zoom transcription will be active for future viewers. How many of you are familiar with the community agreement? Okay, so some of, some of us are, some of us aren't. So firstly, we'd like to invite you to agree to embrace various perspectives as we discuss this material, as well as any potential discomfort you might experience as you learn new things. We encourage you to agree to speak in draft, not everything is going to come out correctly the first time you say it. Uh, this is a learning environment, so we understand that we are all speaking in draft. Uh, we ask you to recognize mixed fluency. Uh, we're all at different stages of experience and education within this particular topic, and we simply ask that you acknowledge that everyone is at a different place of understanding. 
and tying into both of those is assuming positive intent. So sometimes people might be trying to word a, a difficult thing to say and they might it might come out wrong. So giving people the benefit of the doubt in those scenarios and allowing them to speak and draft and revise what they've said is also very important. I think we'd also invite you to say to be thinking about that what's learned leaves and what's shared stays. So if any personal comments or stories are divulged in this conversation, they stay here. But what you learn about these topics is, of course, the intention that that would leave. Be mindful of the bandwidth you use and leave room for others' comments. Like we said earlier, many times we are all speaking in draft. Um, so if somebody says something, don't feel the need to respond to it right away or address it. You can let it sit, kind of give it air and space to breathe. Uh, and finally, we ask that you please share your preferred pronouns uh, if you feel comfortable when uh, introducing yourself for a discussion topic. We'd just like to address you as you wish. All right, so this first video that we found, uh, we mentioned a little bit earlier the I2M Harvard. This video just describes that campaign a little bit more back when it was created. We face a different generation of racism than our parents did. Things were much more blatant, so it was easy to say, that's racist, you're racist, this is a racist institution. But we're facing things that you're like, okay, am I crazy? Or did they just do this? And so it kind of, you internal, we internalize a lot. Yeah. Does anyone have? Y'all look out. That's a dedication. This is Tanzina Vega reporting for the New York Times. At the Lowell Lecture Hall in Cambridge, crowds gathered to see I2 and Harvard a one-night performance put on by students who feel marginalized at the university. Does anyone actually have physical tickets in their hands? And people think we're just gung-ho. Like, no, there were times we didn't, we didn't want to do this because it made us really, like, and have to face things and have to right. face people that we were not, like, prepared to. The play was based on a student interview project and Tumblr page, also called I2 and Harvard. The project focuses on tiny offhand comments, the kind that can seem innocent, but can really sting under the surface. At the beginning of the year, introducing myself to people, um, sometimes people will take a step back and be like, wait, what are you? They're called microaggressions, and younger generations are increasingly responding to them. The microaggressions that I encounter are simply people who don't realize um, my racial background and who really question it. So, are you are you really Asian? Can I see a photo of your mother? Microaggression is an academic term that's been around for decades, but recently it's taken root in social media campaigns as students across the country are questioning whether their generation is indeed colorblind. It's important to have the vocabulary to be able to like describe your lived experiences in order to feel like they're justified because people are always trying to dismiss them. Right. We have to show that like these little daily microaggressions are just like sort of the little bubbling up of greater racial tensions right. that are like underlying this whole post-racial like if we have this post-racial surface there's like all of these extreme racial tensions underneath the surface where people are like oh we have a black president we're post-racial right. but still like it's okay to shoot a child just for having like black skin you don't know how to respond um, you don't want to make it a, a big deal but it is and you almost regret some of those moments there might be a comment that i don't want to think too much into because i'll rather just ignore it and then move on so, but that's why I really enjoy the play, to see those that aren't necessarily ignoring it, but trying to do something about it. Why do you ignore it? Why do you ignore it when someone it's always things to, It's always easier to ignore. To be clear, there's a risk in calling out microaggressions. Some worry it can make a situation more uncomfortable. And critics say these student campaigns are an overreaction to unintended offenses. But for some, conversations like these are a good reminder to be more aware. As a social worker who's gone through many <laughs> lessons of racism and sexism, and where people think they're experts, but they're not, um, and don't recognize that it's a lifetime of learning and a lifetime of interactions where you continue to learn and grow, um, I felt like it was an enormous opportunity to be reminded once again of what's real.
right. So, whoops, wrong button. Um, Ryan is going to share, a sh give a shared d definition of microaggression, so we're all on the same page. But um, part of the reason we're doing that, Vanessa and I wanted to share that we visited residence halls earlier this year as part of this fellowship to try and solicit microaggression stories. And what we noticed was that some white students seemed to confuse microaggressions with negative interpersonal interactions that were unrelated to power structures. I'm going to say that again. They seem to confuse microaggressions with negative interpersonal interactions that were unrelated to power structures. So just for the sake of this room, Ryan's going to give a, more of an explanation about what I just said. All righty. Uh, so what we're going to start with is a dictionary definition to begin with, but as I'm sure we all know, sometimes dictionary definitions aren't very useful. Uh, so the Merriam-Webster definition of a microaggression is a comment or action that subtly or often unconsciously or unintentionally expresses a prejudiced attitude toward a member of a marginalized group. Now, if you don't know what those big words mean, it's a bunch of word soup. So let's break down what is and is not necessary for something to be a microaggression. What is required is bias. Now, everyone here has certain internal and implicit biases towards other people, regardless of whether we acknowledge them or not. So it's always present. The other thing required for a microaggression is some form of structural or societal power over another person. Now, that can come in many different forms, but without that societal power difference between the person aggressing and the receiver of that microaggression, it is not a microaggression. One important thing that is not necessary for a microaggression is intent. You can be saying something you believe is benign or even a compliment, but it could be received very negatively towards that uh, other person. Uh, so as with all things, context is key in every situation. Here are some examples of different kinds of relationships that may enable that societal power difference or microaggression. White black interactions, male female interactions, cisgender transgender interactions, straight queer interactions, or able bodied and differently abled interactions. All of these create the power dynamic imposed by society for a microaggression to happen. All right, so take it away, Sam. All right, taking a page from the professor book, I created a Kahoot. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to get it started. I'm not sure if everyone will be able to participate, but as, if you just go to, well, it's loading the game pin, but if you go to www.kahoot.it and enter that number, you should be able to play. You want to tell them a little more about it? Yeah. Um, I created this Kahoot with situations that are often really like on the line of microaggression or not microaggression and so i've we kind of picked what we thought was the right answer but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's the only answer and this is kind of to create some discussion and and get you guys involved a little bit in the first half because nice names right. um, we've turned on anonymous naming <laughs> You just you go to www.kahoot.it in your search bar, and then you enter this pin. And I just want to share that last night we were going through this, and we, we had really good discussions about all of these examples. We found them challenging, and I think that's part of the point of our presentation today is that sometimes it's really hard to figure these things out, especially for a white person, I think. But um, we welcome input. This, we hope this will be a juicy discussion, and we hope it'll be a safe discussion. I think even yesterday when we were running this, we only came to a consensus on one, maybe two questions. <laughs> and we're the people running the presentation, so. Got a lot of people. <laughs> I wonder if they ever run out of these anonymous names. Probably just have like a decisive name or a total story. Well, now they're reusing adjectives, so. Yeah. Ooh, Groovy Impala. Groovy Impala. I like that one. <laughs> Tame Impala, right? <laughs> no, I yep. All right, all right. Shall we? Looks like it slowed down. 
think we're reaching reaching enough. <laughs> oh, one last one. I'm not sure how many people are on the Zoom call, but. <laughs> Just a bobcat, magic bear. Everyone getting in there? I don't know why helpful puffin is particularly funny to me, but it is. You don't hear puffins very often. All right. Okay. I think we're going to have to move on. My apologies if you didn't have time to uh, hop in, but we've got to get going. So I titled this. <laughs> So a teacher mixes up the names of two Asian students in class. All right, so we have 10 people who thought it was an honest mistake. Eight people who thought it was a microaggression, and 17 who thought it was problematic but not a microaggression. And one who thought it was blatant discrimination. The one who thought it was blatant discrimination. Um, Is the teacher Asian? Yes. Sorry, in this situation, I, I should have clarified that. A white teacher mixes up the names of two Asian students. My bad. Um, and we categorize this, and I heard from, did you say, Sometimes teachers mix up white students' names too. Yeah, if that teacher's yeah. mixing up everybody's names, mm -hmm. then it's maybe okay. But if it's only the Asian students that they screw up, we'll work for it. I also think it depends on what time of the year it is. The mm -hmm. semester start and you mix up the names on like an honest mistake. Um, I will do better mm -hmm. in the duration of the report. Mm -hmm. But it's not the intentionally going in and trying to mix it up. That, it's that's when it comes back to that concept of intent is not required. The important thing here is to think about how that student may react. So in, in that instance where a teacher mixes up a couple of uh, white students' names, uh, a reaction may be like, oh, that was kind of annoying, whatever. But uh, think about how that may be for if you are uh, two Asian students in a class and you get your names mixed up with your fellow Asian students, but the white students there, it, 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 it may be a different experience for those who have to experience that sort of power differential of, oh, it's reinforcing that concept of, oh, I'm an other because they can't even bother to get my name right. Or they can't tell us apart. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to come in on that already because I come to the United States like 12 years ago. This is interesting to me. Every person that, I've, that has come here that has had a name that doesn't sound correct, really, in any way, my mother's name is Maria, right? Mm -hmm. With an Islamic slant to it. She comes here every time people speak to her, they say Maria. They change it immediately mm -hmm. so that it suits them. So mm -hmm. I don't know if I've got friends like in Madagascar. My buddy's name is Lubuna Tulka Harapirin Gasson. That's his name. <laughs> right? I took the time to remember what his name is, right? Mm -hmm. We have an. I would have a, in a place that homogeneously Caucasian, mostly, it's difficult for new names to be in there. So yeah, on the part of the student, as you're trying to indicate, it may be the student I feel slighted and we have to address that, yes. But at the same time, I'm going to be on the side of people who are in education who are saying, I'm trying to engage with you, but give me the leeway to get this correct. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I feel like that definitely it also ties into context is key. Like you said, if it's the first week of classes, the teachers are going through a lot. They have a lot of classes. There's a lot of names to get through. But if it's a month into classes, at that point, it shouldn't be acceptable. Agreed on that. All right, we're going to move on. Oh. Stellar buffalo in the lead. <laughs> Pretty, pretty solid agreement there. 
Um, we had a few, few people who thought it was blatant discrimination, and that was a, a discussion that we had amongst ourselves. Was, is this a microaggression or is this just blatant discrimination? It could go in either, depending on the scenario, I think. But yeah, I think we can all see why that is not OK. Um, are there any questions before I move on? I think, I think it, last night what you all said is worth articulating again. Yeah. Why? I mean, I think most of us understand, but. Yeah, well, we were, we were talking about why it's a microaggression and, and, and how you don't really hear that term applied to men almost ever. Um, it, you also don't hear men called a certain. Mm -hmm. It's just a leadership attribute. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I think out of both of you, the word of fun, many years later, I don't know him. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. All right. So, for those who can't see, a teacher scolds a student for having their phone go off when it was, in fact, their insulin pump giving them an alert. This is another one that I think is situational. I think if it's in the first day of classes, honest mistake is perfectly acceptable. I think it, we, we sort of landed on problematic, not, a, not microaggression, but there was a lot of discussion over diabetes is a disability. Is it a marginalized one? How, how much so? How is that going to be perceived? It's one of those situations where, as Sam said, context is in extremely important. So, um, uh, like sometimes, as as a type one diabetic myself, I don't. I honestly, I I never informed most of my teachers. Maybe that's not great practice, but then I don't have permission to be upset when something like this happens because they had no inclination, they had no clue. So it's one of those situations where. Who knows what, what is the situation there uh, that really determines how problematic an instance like this could be? This was shared. Well, I just want to say to, to me, it's also, it relates to the kind of climate you're creating in the classroom. If the faculty member is, you know, inviting students to let me know of access needs or anything it is that can help support a positive learning environment, then Ryan, maybe you wouldn't feel that you shouldn't be telling somebody this, that the invitation to share information that a student feels is good for the faculty member to know, rather than the faculty member simply relying on the student to come to them. We don't know why a student might be too afraid or shy or for whatever reason, that the context of the environment created that invites sharing, I think, is a That's a great point. Absolutely. This was a real example that was shared when we were in the residence halls. Mm -hmm. So we kind of touched on this one earlier, but a teacher struggles to read or mispronounces a student of color's name while taking attendance. Um, So I think we can kind of, since we already kind of touched on this one, we can probably skip over it. Let's see how it plays out. But um, I would like to share, there's a canvas feature that I've become recently aware of, and maybe oh, I'm seeing nodding, but I believe that an instructor can record their name and that students can record their names so that the instructor knows how to pronounce it in advance of classes starting. So that's something I saw in my other job for UW-Madison Extension. It kind of just caught my eye. I don't use Canvas that much, but it would be a way to look into that before classes start. Also, I just want to add, if a student does have a name that primarily does get mispronounced, if the teacher makes that effort, extra effort to before classes say, oh, I might struggle with that name. Let me look and see how to pronounce it. I can guarantee you that that student will have so much appreciation and be like, oh my gosh, they got my name right like for the first time, so. 
Yeah, we, we did talk about a bit, a bit about this in the other question, so I think we can move forward. So for those who couldn't read, a dancer says they are feeling dizzy and their teacher asks them if they've eaten today in front of the entire class. This is another one that came up in the residence halls. So we landed on, and, and it looks like a lot of you did as well, that it is problematic, but not necessarily a microaggression. And this has to do with power structures. Why don't we ask them? Sorry. <laughs> Thoughts? As someone recovering from an eating disorder, that's absolutely microaggression. Mm -hmm. If that student's anorexic, you just call them out. Mm -hmm. And I feel like definitely um, it, it's a difference if you talk to them in front of the entire class and address it, or just pull them aside one on one, be like, hey, are you all right? Um, I think that's where a big difference would be. Yes? Yeah. We have students that have to come to a class all the time. Where I might not have a chance to get them out the door. I mean, so again, context matters. If I have a student who's like visibly falling in front of me and I can't get them out of the room, I may not have a choice. Um, we do try to get them out, but I mean, I probably have, I probably call an ambulance on campus for a student who passes out from Cab Lab once or twice a semester. Um, so it's. But your difference is a. Don't comment upon anything related to their health or their habits you just address the crisis well, as it occurs because i mean i will ask them like do you need me to get you a snack or some water or something like that because again we want to be supportive but again i again you can't always i guess what i'm saying is i can't always easily remove the student from the situation not that i yell it out for the whole class right but sometimes i can't remove them to have that conversation depending on the situation that they're having and it's an early rest right 8 a.m class or over lunch. It was like an 11 to 2 hours. Someone in the back. Uh, uh, when I worked at another university, if somebody passed out in a lab, we had to call an ambulance. And it was important triage to, to figure out whether there was a larger medical problem or if it was blood sugar. Because blood sugar you can deal with more or less immediately. Other problems might be more difficult, but yes, you try and get the other students out or away, but yeah, you still, you still need to deal with whatever is going on. I think what I'm noticing as someone from the faculty generation is that um, we have different boundaries around questions about our bodies or about our habits in public, and I think something that's come up in our discussions around these topics is that how you approach the student is key. If you're asking them in private, that's preferable to asking them in public. But we even were discussing that at a certain level, that's just not appropriate to be asking certain questions about, there's, there's a boundary that's tighter now around our, our bodies and around our habits and around our choices. And I think for our generation, we have a, a, a bubble that's out here. And this generation is saying, no, that's not your business. I don't, I don't want that addressed and I don't want to talk about that and it's not appropriate. Yes? Perhaps there's also some other assumptions that go with like body shaming or some other like gendered things or things that are discipline specific, right? So the fact that it was a dancer was a flag for me. So ha having trained for years as a dancer when I was younger, there's some assumptions about eating disorder potential or, right? I mean, there's all kinds of kind of popular media representations of what performers do to their bodies. So I think, that might be different than like a chemistry student. Maybe there's overlaps, maybe they do both, right? But I think there's something here about body shaming that, that has to do with the discipline specific context. Yes, and that we may yet get to a, a tableau if we have time today, but a question that was associated with that tableau that we wanted to ask the group or wanted to bring up with the group, Sam, you were talking about like, we were thinking what other disciplines at Stevens Point might have old standards around body shape or size or strength and what maybe might people want to be looking at. And you had a good example. I mean, 
as someone who works in the trades, sexism is pretty rampant in terms of like ability assumptions, like would you, just assuming that, you know, like mansplaining and assuming that a woman's not going to be strong enough to do this or that is definitely a problem that has to do with body and might have, you know, like. You mentioned the DNR, the, the college too of natural resources. Yeah, I mean, like there's a lot of studies here of forestry and, 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 and physical trades where there is that aspect. And, and I don't, I don't, I'm not a forestry major. I don't <laughs> take those classes. So I don't want to say too much because I don't really know, but yeah, I mean, as far as it, my experience in the actual workforce for those areas, there's definitely, it's, it's much harder for, there's a, there's a much larger um, wall to get over in terms of accessing those, those jobs as a woman. Any other thoughts? I just have a question about like, there's a class that has to do with physical practice and your nutritional intake it has a proportionate impact on that activity. Is there another way to, um, is that, would a, a conversation with the group about, let's talk about how you prepare for class and how does your nutrition play a part in the way your class goes, based on whether you eat or not, would, it, would something like that be considered in a microaggression as well, or would that be a general conversation? I think if that were to happen, that happened, it would definitely be not okay. Mm -hmm. If that were to happen on the first day of classes to establish just so that people are, so that you, you've given that information out there, I think that would be okay because you're not singling anybody out. No one's gonna go, oh, we're having this conversation because of what happened yesterday with so-and-so. That To me, that's my initial reaction to that. And I can, speaking as a voice teacher, there are certain things I need to share with students about fluid intake or cycles or, there's a lot, and I'm more and more hesitant to talk about those things. And I've been thinking, I think what you just said is exactly right, that if it's part of the, the syllabus and it just becomes routine, you know, like we're going to have a session on how much water I drink and how my cycle can affect my vocal folds and how you don't want to yell at a football game and all these hygiene things, but it's sort of built in, then that becomes less of an individual response. And then that student is probably less, they won't feel, oh, I'm being targeted. It's more, these are tools that you might not know. Because I think a lot of students don't know those things. I didn't know those things. But yeah, it's a, it's a shifting area. So we're at time. All right. So um, thank you for that discussion. I hope we feel a little <laughs> more comfortable with little each early. other. <laughs> because we'll ask for volunteers in our next portion. Thank you, Sam. But first, we are going to experience a spoken word piece by Vanessa called Deserving. Hold on just a second. All right, so like Lisa said, this is a poem that I wrote called Deserving. The ever-present feeling of weight, the ever-increasing urgency, a want, a need to make a name. For my father, a first-generation immigrant and college graduate. For my mother, a woman from a broken home riddled with abuse and loneliness. For my brothers, gifted with creativity, but minds that prevent them from expressing. For me, a girl who has to prove over and over again, I deserve to be here. I deserve to be here. Do I deserve to be here? Do I deserve to be where I am? To have gotten where I have? To be standing here against the words of criminal, druggy, rapist, words etched in my brain, Remnants of thoughts and statements made by many people in this broken melting pot country. Oh no, not you, said to me, in attempts to disarm ammunition already shot through the loaded gun that is an unfiltered mouth. Come on, we're joking, of course we didn't mean it. Chorused by those deemed allies, pretending protectors of people like me. People like me. People like me can't protect ourselves can't stick up for our livelihood or our namesake. Good, hardworking people who deserve to be here just as much as anyone else. People like me deserve to be here. We deserve to take up room, to be loud and passionate, to be sad and grieve, to live. 
without fear of backlash, judgment for our heritage, of the stories and fables and experiences that make our culture so rich and colorful. Como un enjambre de mariposas, liberadas del cautiverio. Our cultures, regardless of country or place of or origin, deserve to be celebrated and cherished, as each adds color and pattern to the ever-growing quilt that is this country, the United States of America. United we stand, divided we will surely fall. We have one more video to share, and then we're going to take a five minute break. This it's, video, yeah, it's meant to be humorous. So like, don't be afraid to laugh or chuckle. It's meant, it's meant to be ridiculous. Not good at all, but you're white. Ryan. People of color have to deal with racial microaggressions every single day. So microaggressions are those little unintentional insults that basically see people of color as stereotypes, which got me thinking, what if white people had to deal with racial microaggressions? So like, where are you from? No, no, like, where are you really from? Why don't you have an accent? Like a, like a Swedish accent. You know, your English is really, really good. It's like, I can't even tell you have an accent or anything. I don't have an accent. No, that's what I'm saying. You don't speak Gaelic? You don't speak German? Can you say a curse word in European? You know, like, what does that even mean? <laughs> hey, Connor, um, you know about NASCAR stuff, right? Um, can you take a look at this? Can you teach me how to line dance? Play the banjo. Act entitled in the supermarket. I love white food. No real flavor to it. Never an upset tummy. You're so exotic. How do you get your hair like that? I love how it's so limp. Ew, why does it feel like that? Oh my god, so it just does that? No, you are really pretty for a white girl. Your eyes are so round, like this. You know who you look like? Kenny Chesney. Zach Braff. Emma Stone. Rachel Maddow. My friend Chad. Maybe you know him, because he's white too. No, Emma Watson. Not Macklemore, what's the, what's the other guy? No, is it Emma Thompson? It's C-H-A-D. Like Chad. One of the Emmas. You look like an Emma. You know who you look like? I bet you hear this all the time. Jeffrey Dahmer. How does it feel to be the token white guy in the office? Hey, Connor, can we get a white perspective on this? I love everything about white culture. You guys are like so fun. What do you mean you don't listen to Creed? You're white. You've never tried meth, but you're white. You don't act like a normal white person. You're not really white, though. You're not really white. <laughs> I'm whiter than you are. So, did all your ancestors own slaves? No, but of course he wishes that he could still own slaves. That's a part of his culture. Bryce, back me up on this one. The thing you have to understand about white culture no, is that white people are- No, I went to an historically are... white college, so okay, I know about white culture. Okay, but I backpacked in Europe. So can you say how ridiculous this was? I know, story of my life. If you've ever experienced microaggressions because of your race, gender, sexuality, or body type, go ahead and vent about it in the comments. Can you teach me how to like, take a really popular rap song and like make it a ukulele song? It's so cool. I think it's so cool how you guys do that. All right, thank you. We'll take a five minute break.
Oh, you turned it off? All right. So we're moving into the next phase of our presentation, which is more participatory. So no one has to participate, and you have two options for providing us with feedback. We're going to be acting out a couple of scenarios that, we have, that have been observed. And as you're watching the scene, we'd like you to consider at what points could less harmful choices have been made by the faculty member in this scene. And then as you think about that, we're going to finish this scene, and then we're going to rewind it. And you're going to have the opportunity. You're going to have two opportunities. Either A, to actually come up and take the role of the instructor, and we'll rewind it, and then you can respond in a different way. And you'll understand once you see the scene. Or if no one feels comfortable doing that, you can raise your hand and direct the actors towards a more positive outcome. All right? So this scene is called dead naming. The first day of class. Okay. Uh, Vanessa? Here. Great. And Riley? Oh, um, I, I actually go by Ryan now. Uh, R Y. A N. Uh, okay. One week later. Great. And Vanessa. Here. And Riley. It's Ryan. Oh God, you're so right. I'm sorry. It's just I, you know I had you in that other class and I. It's a switch for me, you know. I, no, it's, it's, I and we we I lost my attendance sheet, so I had to print out a new one, and it's the, fine. the correction hasn't come through yet. I'm really sorry, though. I I know that's probably super it, embarrassing. It's for you fine. And, it's fine. Um, uh, I'm sorry. It's fine. Later that same day. All right. So, can anybody tell me the area of this circle? Oh, uh, yes, Riley. Um. <laughs> sorry. Um, okay, Vanessa? They prefer to go by Ryan, and the answer is 4 pi. All right, what were the problems? Where were the points, and Sam's going to take notes, where were the points where the instructor could have been less harmful? Where do you, what, where do you, what are problematic areas in this interaction? Does anyone want to? Yeah, I think you speak to yourself a foot on the curb there. Because <laughs> as soon as you made the mistake the first time, when you said Ryan, the, the response I go by Ryan now, you said, oh, good. And just carried on. That discussion about like what you did before, how you knew him before, that's not part of the engagement right now. Because it's too public right there. Yeah. It might intrigue you, and you might. The, the, I feel the thing is like the scene indicates the personal embarrassment at having made the mistake and now trying to justify it in that moment <laughs> can't justify it in that moment yeah so at that point yeah. you gotta stop it's like oh okay I'll just carry on we discussed it it's at that point by the instructor responding in that way they're making it more about themselves and making it even worse for the student so um would someone like to step into the scene and fix it oh You'll try? <laughs> oh, that'd be great. All right. What? Okay. Ready? It's the first day of class. Hi, welcome to class. We're going to try to create a braver space here together. Here's some card stock. Please write your preferred name and your gender pronouns so that we can all share and, and uh, respect each other together. That's how I would. That's great. Wow. I love, I love that you brought props for us. This, yeah, is, a, no this is a very beautiful yeah. pointer and, piece of paper. And, and I, think, I think another solution in a, like, in a larger class, because if you're teaching like 120 students, you're going to have a harder time with that. But I could see passing around the attendance sheet or talking about the new option on Canvas that allows you to do that. But I like that. Yeah, addressing it mm -hmm. right off the bat. It's great. Love it. Well, I feel like that's kind of... <laughs> hit it. They, they, they got it. That's hit All right. It. Home run. So um, uh, how about we move on to scenario number two and well, we might. Really quick, another thing that we could do is if you did make that first mistake on the first day of classes, um, making sure to make a note to yourself and make sure that you act on that note, like 
right after class or as soon as you have that first amount of free time so that you make sure that you don't make that mistake a second time, further embarrassing the student, yourself, kind of putting them in that situation. I have an idea playing off of that. Would anyone be willing to come up and show what you could do if you did make the mistake again? What would be the appropriate way to acknowledge it? And if you didn't get started off on the right foot, for whatever reason, you, you forgot your rule book, or is there anyone willing to step in and model that interaction? It was kind of the second one. OK, great. Okay, great. <laughs> yeah. So Riley is the yes. resident name? Yes. Okay. So um, I can't remember what, what was the actual one. Uh, can anyone tell me the area of the circle? Okay. Can anyone tell me the area of the circle? Riley? Oh, um, it, it's Ryan. Thank you. Ryan. Uh, yeah, it's a four or five, I think. Very good, Ryan. Thank you. Great. I like that. Yeah. yeah. I like that, right? Yeah. I couldn't remember the circle. <laughs> Imagine. I don't have the answer yet. Circle of the mind. I guess the only other question or comment I would make is that I, I, there's been a situation where I didn't do this, but I did something else that was harmful. And I remember how embarrassed I felt. And uh, this was like a few years ago. And I reacted totally out of, well, that wasn't what I meant. And I'm not one of those people. And I still regret that moment because I became very defensive and White, whitely fragile, and yeah, what you just did, that, that just acknowledged it, thank you. That was great. Yeah, and I, and I actually like that you added in the thank you. Like, mm -hmm. thank you for giving me the benefit of the doubt here and allowing me time to make this correction in my brain, acknowledging the generosity on, on their part for telling me that. And you, and you said the name, the correction, in that small moment. There was one moment I think that I had a student in the classroom was identifying different to the norm. Yeah? So I was, it was very difficult because I had already reminded myself I got to remember this person that identifies differently, has a different name. And so I moved and I was on the board, I was writing something and I said, as so and so said, as he said, I said. And it was like, and I was writing to the board, and I was like, I didn't just say that. I was like, and I just carried on writing, and I ignored it for the moment. And then afterwards, you know, when the class was done, I was like, hey, I need to speak to you because I was done. You know, but I just thought if I stopped right there, try to make it a thing, it was not going to be good. So I just, I was mumbling to myself, but I carried on. And then when class was done, I was like, okay, we need to talk because I clearly stumbled over there. You know, so. You have to take the moment when you think it's, that's the moment that will resonate best, mm -hmm. you know. Sometimes in the if, if you if you're trying to de-escalate, you're actually escalating sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So how did the students react to you after? Oh, we it was by far one of the best students. Uh, actual comment, I quote: "I know I'm going to fail this course, but I like uh, the stories you tell." <laughs> Perhaps I resonated more I've with a student. <laughs> All right. all right well should we move to all right I think so we've hit all our bases on that one yes yeah. so we'll move oh yeah is there is there value in, in that, that situation to correcting yourself and saying i'm sorry to the student to, to demonstrate better behavior to the class as a whole to, to, to acknowledge that you made a mistake and that there could be, you know, there is a way to um, minimize the energy. Personally, I feel like how handled that was very well, or very good rather, um, addressing the student afterwards. Um, you could make an example to the class by, from that point out, being correct. You know, and that point out really making a conscious effort to address the student correctly after you've apologized to them individually because as you say something students will be like oh they address them correctly this time like good because we're sometimes we're consciously aware of things like that we like hone in on them um so i definitely feel like if you apologize to the student individually and then you fix the mistake preventing you from doing it 
multiple times again, I think that's sufficient. I, I think the other crucial difference between the two scenarios is that I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't catch your name. Um, Elvin. I, I, yeah, yeah. Alvin. Alvin. Alvin, thank you. <laughs> All right. Is an Alvin scenario attention wasn't already on the student? You know, in in that case, it was a, a, a comment that had he had Alvin turned around and, and said, "I'm sorry, I'll get it right next time." It would have added more attention to the student. Whereas in our scenario, I called on the student and they corrected me, so the attention was already there. And I think that's a crucial difference. I think if the attention is already there, absolutely. Make an example of saying, thank you, my bad, Ryan, Ryan, you know, say, say the correct name twice. If the attention isn't there, then yeah, adding, addressing it later might be the better solution. That was the difference that I saw. All right, let's move into the next scenario. So this is a faculty on staff situation. We have a chair over here. And so my no, question stand, would be, <laughs> have you seen this happen or participated in happening it? I'd like you to consider class and equity in your department, whose input matters, whose doesn't. Consider the prevalence, the increasing prevalence of adjunct and academic staff, it's now a majority in many US universities, and consider race, gender, seniority, and other factors that then intersectionalize with this kind of a situation and exacerbate it. Alrighty, everyone, uh, you remember the last week we talked about the issues with enrollment and outreach. Uh, I was wondering if uh, you guys were able to come up with any solutions that we might be able to. Uh, yes, Lisa. Thanks, Dr. Niedenthal. Thank you. Yeah, I was really thinking about our outreach to um, schools where we haven't historically been present, and I feel like we just really need to focus on that to increase our enrollment capacity. So I thought, I've heard a lot of students who are in our program now say that part of the reason they came here was a personal connection they had with us before they decided to come here. And so I thought we could target some schools that we haven't been historically doing outreach with. And then after giving a brief introduction to each of our programs, we can invite those interested students out for lunch and give them a chance to connect with us. And that way they'd feel like when they got to our campus that they already had someone there to welcome them. Okay, okay. Uh, any, other, any other ideas? Any? Oh, uh, yes, Vanessa. Maybe we could go to the schools that we've been going to predominantly in the past and really really hammering in on those so we increase the um, admissions here as opposed to other competing schools. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, any, anybody else? Anybody else? I, I hear what Vanessa is saying, but I think, um, or sorry, may I? Oh, no, please uh, continue, Professor Gaines. Um, I, I hear what Vanessa is saying, but I think, um, I think we'd have more benefit going to schools that we haven't gone to in the past um because i mean i think a lot of those schools just don't really know about us so if we go there introduce our programs and then i was thinking we could maybe host a lunch so that we could um create some rapport with those students you know because the more personal connection they have the more likely they are to come here okay okay i like i like that idea i'd like to discuss that further because i mean the whole concept of a lunch. I yeah, know. I know there's yeah. more expensive. Are you gonna pay for that? <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> That's that. Any factors that you notice? Yes. <laughs> yes. This doesn't so much happen in faculty meetings that I have been involved in, but I don't think that the apparently male identifying um, faculty members should be professors and doctors and, and the women first named. Let's just start with that. Yes, that was the first that plan. Was, <laughs> that would be nuts. That was one thing we wanted. To, we, we set that up as an inequity, but I, I know that, or I've come across um, material that folks of color are not always addressed by their honorifics. 
and white people are. So that's one reason we just, I mean, I'm not a person of color, but that's one reason I wanted to bring that into this. We were also trying to stress, well, I don't want to say, yeah, <laughs> the gender difference. That's kind of what you just brought up. Um, any other observations or thoughts on this? How many folks have seen an idea rob happen? How many people have had an idea rob happen to them? <laughs> yeah, it really sucks. The difference in who put up their hand yeah, uh, the, second oh, the second time. Could you say that again? Notice the difference on who, uh, who has witnessed an idea rob happen and who has had it happen to them. Very uh, broad demographic <laughs> for who's witnessed it and a very specific one for who's had it happen to them. So does anyone feel comfortable taking the chair's position and making that interaction go differently. Come on down. <laughs> Come on down. All the right. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I think we've heard a couple of different ideas here as Lisa and Bob <laughs> pointed out. We might get a little bit more traction by going to historically underserved uh, institutions, but I agree with Vanessa that we need to keep up our uh, outreach to the schools that we have been visiting. I think that these are all very good ideas. Now let's form a working group so that we can divide the labor and see who's going to hit which schools. Think, I mean, yeah, that made that would make yeah. me feel validated. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I really like that you didn't only single out with the two people whose ideas you mostly identified and thought were the strongest. You kind of addressed each of our ideas so that, I don't know, like nobody felt left out or discluded from the conversation or the task at hand. So. I'm sorry, I didn't have a name. It's <laughs> Sam, it's fine. <laughs> I don't have a name tag. I, I should have a name tag. <laughs> Bob? Yeah. Yeah. I, I sometimes build things, so. <laughs> I think, Nancy, what I liked about what you said, too, is that, I mean, like, we were rehearsing this last night, and I was like, oh, this sounds kind of petty. But <laughs> I wanted to be petty. <laughs> I'm not lying. I wanted to be petty, but I don't think that would have served a good purpose. No, and I think, you know, you can have the same idea. We're many, we're smart. We're all smart. Many people often have the same idea. What is hurtful is when someone else gets commented upon for having that idea and the, the other person doesn't and then if it's related to gender or status that really stings because then that just points out you really don't matter your, your voice does not matter here so but, but i think if i were in your position in this meeting originally i would have felt bad to begin with because sam bob is checking his phone. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> that is, so, yes. And so it's hard to tell if he was robbing your idea or if he just really wasn't paying attention to you. <laughs> but either way, it diminishes who you are and what your input is. So. Yeah, and that, that's, that's sort of an astute observation. And what I was going for was exactly that. Like, as soon as Lisa started talking, I stopped listening. I checked out. Yeah. So that in and of itself is hurtful. Inappropriate. And inappropriate. Great. Thank you so much. All right. Well, folks, we, we left 15 minutes at the end for discussion or questions. Um, I'm having this idea right now. If and colleagues let me know if you object or I don't know if people are going to be interested, but does anyone have an interaction they would like to see dramatized or that they would like to dramatize themselves at this point? Or would you just like to discuss or ask any questions that you have of us, of this team? Questions, comments, feedback, concerns? Okay, it looks like it's a no on the, on the, on the improv. <laughs> <laughs> that's all right, that's all right. I think this has been a great day. Um, and we didn't improv these either. So here we are. Yes, Alvin. Yeah, I think I want to start off with well, something just so we all know. We're going to do a new semester, so perhaps it's probably a good time to say it. Um, if we're dealing with uh, students from other places that come to the United States and study, specifically Africa, 
right, the continent, which has 54 different <laughs> countries involved. Can we please not say, oh, I just want to go to Africa? You got to be very specific where you're going to. If we go to Europe, we typically say, I'm going to Paris, or I'm going to Italy, or I'm going to Spain, or whatever. I'm specifying where I'm going eventually, right? But it's very interesting, as soon as Africa is thrown out, you know, Kenya is 9,000 miles from where I stayed in Cape Town, in South Africa. But it's one of the strangest things, like, people would say things like, oh, you're from Africa? I know a friend in Kenya. I know a friend in Cameroon. I'm like, that means nothing to me. It's like you coming to Cape Town, South Africa, and I hear that you've got the accent from the United States, which is one country in the North Americas. It's not America, there's Central South and, you know, North. So it's like, looking at you, I'm like, where are you from? I'm from, West, from Wisconsin. I'm like, I got a friend in Texas. It means nothing. <laughs> it means nothing, right? It's that kind of thing. The mindfulness in terms of being specific, I think that helps a lot. And taking the care to want to be that specific about certain things, I think is also important. Is that where some of the microaggressions can come from? Um, I was just discussing with some, some of my colleagues here on the side. One of the programs I was invited to on campus once, like, would you like to be part of the study? I was like, yeah, sure. Um, turned out the study was treating it as if English was my added or additional language. Oh, I was like, oh, oh. I, you know, uh, I have to refuse because English is actually my first language. <laughs> I just happen to come from a place where it's got 11 official languages and a smattering of others. So it's like, and then also at the same time to conflate certain things adds to the microaggression. Because if you think about South Africa as 4% of the land mass of the continent of Africa, I can't speak for the 96% of, of, of Africa, right? I'm already just trying to speak for myself anyway, right? So there's those kinds of things, even when I come here, like as someone who's transitioned to the United States, it's an interesting phenomenon to, to interact with students, to find out more information. Now, I know it was alluded to earlier, um, Lisa mentioned it, that there's a, there's a younger generation and older generation. Older generation seems to have this idea that, well, you're slightly more mature if you don't get easily offended. Mm. Younger generation, we are at that point where it's like, well, we easily just take a front at everything, right? So it's like, well, you've got to find a balance somewhere in between. Some things are worth fighting for and some things are not. But in the discussions that we're having, you guys both, uh, Sam and Brian both pointed out that we are to be concerned about the context within which things are happening. That context describes immediately how I'm going to, it's this one size fits all thing that's not going to work, to my mind. And then the yours, uh, poem that you were going on about, the release of butterflies, right? From liberated from captivity. It's, I don't like the word freedom, I prefer the word liberty. I'll tell you why. Freedom suggests that there's no law at all. Liberty suggests that I was hamstrung by some stuff, but I've moved into a better space. It's almost like saying I studied myself out of that. So I think this kind of workshop is like, oh, I realize that I need to study myself out of that into a new space. So I think if everybody's got that mindset, it's going to be a growth process. You're definitely going to, <laughs> I think you're definitely going to rub some people the wrong way. <laughs> But the effort involved in trying to get there, that's the, that's the important part. Absolutely. The whole, the whole purpose, I feel, just oh. to comment on that real quick, uh, the whole purpose of that, I feel, is, or of this and the work that Lisa and I did in the residence halls is just to make you aware of things you possibly weren't aware of before. Like, it's very easy that if no one says anything, no one makes you uncomfortable by calling out something you might have done, then you will just keep acting in that, uh, that ignorance. Uh, ignorance is not always bliss, especially in this case. Um, so the goal here is that your learning and your knowledge does not stop here. If there was something said today that makes you uncomfortable, do a little bit more research. Why did that make me uncomfortable? What is it about that that struck a chord to me that just wasn't good? Uh, so definitely what you were saying is I agree with that. Just don't let the learning stop here. Keep learning. Lindsay, is there a chat? Yes, we have a chat question. What are your recommendations for disseminating these techniques to a wider audience? Uh, this particular person in the chat has a sense that I share, I will say, as Lindsay, I'm saying this, um, that the kind of people who are interested in this event and who have attended this morning mm -hmm. and brave the cold are already doing this kind of work. Mm -hmm. This is the, mm -hmm. the choir, so to speak. So, And I am super interested in your answer to this question. 
How do we disseminate um, it? I, uh, I can't, um, I can't speak specifically for um, disseminating it to other faculty, but uh, sort of instilling these kind of things in students, I feel like is these kind of behaviors is going to be a really important thing. We know, I know it's kind of cliche, but teachers are role models. I grew up, both my parents were public school teachers in Minnesota, and so I got to see a lot of their interactions with students pretty closely, and I got to see both ends of it, which was really enlightening to me. And how often we as students can see teachers, even not even talk, we may never talk to them outside of asking questions, saying hi when we enter in class and saying thanks when we leave. That may be all the interaction we have with them, but we take so much from them. And so even just instilling a couple of these practices in, in your classrooms, in your workspaces, may help, um, may help the students that you work with sort of latch onto these and have some starting point to be like, oh, when I went to uh, so-and-so's class, they did this, this, and this. Well, how did that make me feel? It made me feel seen. It made me feel represented. And that they would be more willing to apply that in their own lives. And then we can life butterflies from there. Uh, Lindsay, another one? Oh, wait, wait, Michael has a... Uh, yeah, I think, Lindsay, in relation to that, the previous question, I think the two things come to my mind that the chair of the department or assistant deans could invite this group to a faculty meeting, right? And have the whole school of uh, performing arts, because that's where I am, engage in this conversation, make an active choice to do that. I also think there's possibility for us on this campus to think about our retention, tenure, promotion process, and when uh, people are being observed in their classes, to consider these practices as uh, excellent uh, teaching demonstrations that so that we're prioritizing uh, the development of our practices on this campus, and that's reflective in the way that we uh, critique, evaluate, and discuss uh, teaching progress on this campus. Lindsay. So we have another question from the chat, which is how do you confront microaggression? So perhaps in that last uh, scenario that you gave us that last scene, we have the chair coming in, Nancy, you know, stepping in and sort of doing the chair's role differently. But if you actually uh, wanted to confront that microaggression as another participant in that meeting, maybe that's something we could play around with here for the last couple of minutes. Maybe not as a ooh, that's a great idea because yeah. there are ways to do that. Um, here, can we improv real quick? Okay, so theater and dance students for a reason. I'm gonna I'm gonna ask Vanessa to do something. Okay. <clears throat> oh, back in the meeting room. Back in the meeting room. So how was lunch? No, it was great. <laughs> yeah, I haven't had it yet. <laughs> <laughs> so let's run it from the top and we'll change it. All right. All right, so you all remember uh, the enrollment and outreach, outreach issues we uh, talked about last week. I was wondering if uh, any of you had any feedback on how we could solve that uh, issue. Uh, yes, Lisa. Thanks, Dr. Niedenthal. Yes, I was thinking that we needed to reach out to schools that we haven't historically been involved with and that it would be helpful if we established a personal bond with the students that are there. I've heard from students here that chose our school that they had some kind of personal visit or interaction with students or faculty prior to choosing us because they felt they felt like they'd be more welcomed. So I think if we went to those schools, shared information about our program, and then took those students out for lunch and really spent some personal time with them, that that could really improve our contact and then retention. Okay. Okay. All right. Oh, uh, yes, Vanessa. I think that if we go to the schools that we've gone to predominantly before and keep just building up our report with them, um, making them choose to come to our school instead of our um, competing schools. That would be good. Okay, okay, okay. Um, oh, uh, yes, Professor Kinsey. Um, I, I hear what Vanessa is saying, and I, and I think that's, you know, possibly a good idea. 
Um, but I think we should be focusing on the schools that we haven't gone to before, because I think a lot of people just don't know about us. So if we were to go to schools we haven't gone to before, and also maybe maybe do something to make some more uh, interpersonal connections, like maybe take them out to lunch or something after we present our, our programs, I think that would be a really effective way to, to bring in more students. If I may, I, I do think that is a good idea. Uh, I think that Lisa stated it very well the first time when she pitched that idea. I think we should definitely discuss um, more, more about the lunch because the budget of that, we would have to figure that out. But I, I do agree with Lisa and, and Sam later on as well that that is a good idea. I think, yeah, working out, that would be a, that would be a budget concern, you know, where can we allot that kind of money? Where are we taking them? Is this subway or is this like somewhere nice? <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> No diss against Subway, but I mean, <laughs> we're not I think we've been <laughs> I have one more idea. I have one more idea. That was fantastic. Let's try it. Here's one more idea. You all are in the meeting. We're coming into the meeting. Or, um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't mean to villainize you too, but we'll, we'll stay in that. Okay. Oh, no, it's okay. <laughs> Love it. Um, okay. Oh, yes. Yeah. Vanessa, can I right? ask you a favor? Game last yeah. Night? Oh, yeah, Dallas so, really just ate it. I mean, when did So not? I find that every time we go into these meetings, <laughs> I'm trying to share an idea, and it's happened in the past. Um, I feel like the male faculty sometimes pick my ideas up. Has that ever happened to you? It has, um, to be quite honest with you. It's something that we just don't really talk about. We just kind of take it and just continue on with our day. Um, yeah, so thanks. I really appreciate that. I, I had an idea. Would you be willing in this meeting, there's an idea that's really important to me. Mm -hmm. Would um, you be willing to, after I share it, echo the idea? Or, I mean, I don't know, maybe you don't think it's a good idea, but if you agree with what I say, are you willing to kind of consensus with me so that it doesn't have to be my idea, I just would like it recognized and not co-opted by somebody else. Yeah, definitely. I'll give it a listen for sure. Thanks a lot. Of course. I've now I have to be I didn't make that up. I saw something like that in another scenario. <laughs> the, yeah. Um, I just wanted to point out because I think that that was really important great job that in in the real world there can be repercussions for that, especially if Sam Bob is is you know one of one of the uh, tenured and very respected members of the faculty, and Lisa is a new person on the faculty or academic staff, or um, perhaps an ADA in the department who's at the department meeting, just voicing an idea that there can be blowback for that. That is very difficult to prove, but can still be very harmful. So you have to weigh. absolutely, absolutely. That's where it comes back concept of the power structure, the societal power structure, where we are, we have, in this situation, we have all the power. I'm the senior faculty member, another tenured member. I, we hold a lot of control when it comes to that situation. So reaching out and uh, trying to correct that can be a very daunting and very da like scary thing to do. And that's why it's important for uh, uh, people who have that power to be aware of those differences so that it's much less scarier when your job is not on the line. And so people who have that kind of security and who have that kind of power within the system are the ones who are in the best position to be able to stand up for those who don't have that. So in this, in this situation, uh, Vanessa was the one who stood up for Lisa, but it, maybe in an optimal situation, it would be Sam. It would be Sam who stands up and says, I think Lisa had a really good idea. Uh, I think we should come back to that and not skip over it. Along with the really quick, along with the idea of not having your job on the line, there's also strength in numbers. So, like, kind of when Lisa and I were convening outside of the conference room, um, addressing that it's something that has happened in the past, but nobody really speaks about it. There's just it's it's more powerful if more people are aware of it and more people are willing to make a comment, make a statement against microaggression that's happening yes and to wrap up on that note i just want to share that like my colleagues in this room have made me feel supported and valued in my department but i'm not i don't feel that not all colleagues i have have always made me feel that way and this was important to me to bring up because it is an issue on more and more campuses a b just go back to what uh lindsay asked 
I think that how we can change, one thing I'm trying to do is just, I don't know, any time in a conversation that some little thing comes up that's along these lines, I'm trying to be braver about saying, wow, what makes you think that about that group? Like, well, why don't you go to Milwaukee? What do you mean you don't go to Milwaukee? Why? And I play dumb. Tell me more about that. Mm -hmm. Because if instead of just letting it go, so in my daily life, just making a tiny choice, and this can be at school or this can be in, outside of school, to not let those things slide and to actually hear them and register them. That's tiny, that's probably cliche, but it is really hard to think about because we all are the choir in this room. And sometimes when you go to other places, it's really challenging that those folks are, folks might not want to hear this, it's hard. But I love the idea of, of uh, taking folks into the room and you know, engaging. We hope we try to engage with a little humor and a little seriousness and some interaction and some lecture and try to make it a, a learning modality that would appeal to everybody. So um, I have thank yous before we end. <laughs> So I would like to recommend, of course, as resources, the Center for Inclusive Teaching and Learning. Duh. Woo! All right. And I would like to thank, before we wrap up, Michael Martin, Sarah Olson, and Ihor Bardachewski. Oh, good. For tech support, <laughs> staging, and logistics prep. Thank you, Lindsay Bernhagen, for your support of this work and of the theater and dance department. We really appreciate that. Thank you to Vanessa, the Pathways intern on this project, for sharing her perspectives. Thank you to the entire creative team for sharing your talents and your time. This is not a class. They were not paid. That's a gift that they gave to us. I want to say thank you very much. Thank you to the Department of Theater and Dance for making room for this work on an ongoing basis. And thank you all for being here. Thanks, and have a great day. You want us to finish or something? <laughs> <laughs> I want to finish or something. Yeah, yeah. That doesn't look right. How do you come? <laughs> <laughs> How do you come? How do you come? How do you come? Very good point. Very good point. Um, I'll do one more thing. I'm in the math department, so this is probably one of the thoughts that I have. Can you put on some music? Let's do this against the... Uh, let's do... Circle with two. The point of if, if people are born in a certain context where there's a lot of little truth and lots of lies, they need to get grown out of this to the bit. So the metaphor of metamorphosis of the butterfly being released and operated into this space. And ultimately, this is where we'd all like to be, as I up as we can be, right? But some people are here where they might have a lot of truth, but very little love. They're trying to find space. Some people have a little love, very little truth. Others have a lot of love, but no truth. And we're trying to find the balance here. And there's truth and love in the way that we deal with our kids, in the way that we connect with our students. Thank <laughs> you.